The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Beautiful. I'd like to welcome uh, all of you. we got so many family members back in town and just so glad to have all of you and it's good to see your faces and just be received in love and fellowship. Glad you are here. I want to make a quick announcement before I got started is that the Elder Board has been putting in some long uh, hours and studying on the, the church, its function, and particularly membership, and really some of the structures of our current environment uh, that we live in. So we're going to be sharing with you in the new year uh, during Sunday school on January, the first three weeks in January, I think it's actually January 12th, 19th, and the 26th. Well, during the Sunday school hour, we'll we'll all be coming in here and we'll be examining and looking at the different pieces of what the Bible shares uh, about membership in the church. And I'm going to kick it off on the 5th during the worship service, and we'll be looking really at the heart uh, of church membership and the beauty of what it is. And so I just want to ask you that you would really work hard to come to those sessions. I think it's going to be a real uh, life-changing time uh, as we as we examine, and I think my own heart is how low the view of the church is today in our day and age in America, and and I want to look at God's view of it, and and why we should just love it and delight in what He's designed. So really encourage you uh, to come be a part of that. Well, this morning uh, was the last Sunday in Advent, and I thank the Salinas family. Uh, for coming up and, and reminding us of those beautiful truths, a lot of what we'll look at in the Word of God this morning. So it's been a good season, Advent season. And as a church, we've been studying through Luke chapter 2. So if you will turn there, we've been trying to prepare our hearts for the glory of the incarnation, God becoming flesh. And the study has been just such a good blessing to my own heart. I feel so dialed in. Uh, we have looked at Luke 2, 1 through 7, at the, the birth of God, the, the greatest event in the history of the world, uh, besides the cross and his second coming all tied together. But we, we saw that he came in a manger. He came into a stable. The, the, the Son of God came in such a humble, beautiful way to really lower the bar to, to show sinners it's safe to come to Christ for this salvation that God has purposed for all of eternity. And so I just want every heart here to never say, oh, I'm too great of a sinner. I got to stay away from coming to Christ for salvation. I want you to see that he's bidding you. He wants you to come and have the eternal life that he came into this world to bring. The second week, we looked at the the birth announcement, and now the greatest announcement ever uh, is going to come through uh, shepherds. They were the lowest rung in the society of, of on the ladder of the of society, and so God comes now and He appears with an angel, and His glory fills this little place in Bethlehem where they're shepherding their sheep, and then they're told who this baby is and why He's come into the world, and He has He has come. I bring glad tidings of good news for unto you. There's and born a Savior, Christ the Lord. And so we just delighted in all the glory and beauty that comes in this birth. Now this morning we're going to take up in Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 35, and we're going to consider Simeon. Uh, He's going to prophesy again, and he's going to tell us as he's led by the Spirit of God the significance of this baby that was born uh, into Bethlehem. So as we begin this morning, before we pray, I just want to read Paul's summary of what we're looking at in Galatians 4. He said, when the fullness of the time came, this birth, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law for the purpose in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. So we don't, let's take, let's go before our God then and just pray This morning, Father, I thank you for the fullness of time. I thank you that Christ Jesus has come into this world. And I thank you that he still invades this world by your spirit. I thank you that he opens eyes and unstops uh, ears and gives new hearts to see the glory and the beauty of what happened that Christmas morning and what happened as we just heard on the cross when our sins were paid for by the Son of God. So I pray this morning, God, that you will draw us in to the prophecy of Simeon and that we will all behold the beauty and the glory of Jesus Christ. Meet us, we pray, 
in your word, through your spirit, for your glory. Amen. This morning, we're going to look at Christmas through the eyes of an aged saint, Simeon. We don't know his exact age, but most commentators seem to lean towards it. He was advanced in years as he's been waiting for this Messiah. It feels like his whole life, you know, he's, I'm, I'm kind of leaning as well that he's probably aged. And so uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 35, here's our outline. I want to look at Simeon's testimony this morning with two main headings. First, in verses 21 through 24, we get some preliminaries about him. And then the presentation of the baby in verses 25 through 35. And so I want to look at uh, uh, some subdivisions under that as the man in verses 25 through 26, Simeon, and then his message in verses 27 through 35. So let's look first this morning at the preliminaries. Look with me in verse 21. When eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And so the circumcision uh, in the obedience to the law, Jesus would be circumcised, which we know was given to Israel through Abraham. And circumcision would bring you into the covenant community. And all male babies were to be circumcised on the eighth day. And when they did, they would name the baby. And Mary and Joseph, uh, we're we're told now, they came and they named him Jesus, which is the name that the angels uh, told him, you shall shall name him. And it means Yahweh is salvation. That's the name that Joseph and Mary were told by that he's going to be a savior. And then we look at his consecration in verse 22. When the days for their purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord As it was written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. So Mary goes then to be purified. The laws of purification, she goes into the temple in Jerusalem, and there she's presenting her son to God. And as the very firstborn, he would be consecrated, he would be holy. And so Mary and Joseph come And they present Jesus, dedicating him to the Lord and unto his service. So those are our basic preliminaries. I I don't want to get lost in them, but I just wanted you to hear them. So now our second main point where we will park this morning is the presentation. The presentation, and I want you to look first with me at the man in verses 25 through 26. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout. And he was looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit (coughs) was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And there was a man then in Jerusalem named Simeon. It doesn't tell us who he was. Uh, Most of my commentators, as I was studying, were leaning that he was a priest, maybe serving in the temple. Uh, We have to assume that we're not told for sure. But we know very little about Simeon up until this day. And so again, I assume he's an old man. He's been named after Jacob's son, Simeon. The word means God has heard. I think it was a very fitting name as he was praying and longing for the coming of the sunrise from on high who would come with healing in his wings upon the nations. And so God has heard after 400 years of silence from the prophets. We've heard of nothing since Malachi from the word of God. And now here it is, Simeon, God has heard. And I think one of the things that Luke wants us to get from this man is his character. He tells us this man was righteous and devout. Righteous is the word before God. Before God, he was righteous. And before men, he was devout and and devoted to the service of this God and worship. Same description of Zacharias and Elizabeth and Mary in chapter 1. So we're, we're seeing that there was this faithful remnant who are still in those dark days of Israel are looking and longing for the promised Messiah. The other thing we're told about his character is he's, he's filled with hope. He's looking for the consolation of Israel. Simeon had his eyes fixed on what God had promised. And so the consolation of Israel was God's promised salvation. And Simeon is 
longing and looking for that promise. And so it, ha it has been a long time of silence. There's Roman dominion and control over Israel. The depravity of society is great. Yet that did not dim this man's hope. He trusted in God and he trusted in what he had promised. And so with all that long time in darkness, he's still looking for God's manakim, which, which means his consolation. The consolation, this word uh, meant a comforter. It was the word used for Messiah. And so he is waiting and longing for that day. We're looking, the, when will Messiah come? And we're told that the Holy Spirit was upon him. And so what did the Holy Spirit tell Simeon? Look with me in verse 26. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So a long time of silence, yes. But verse 26, can you imagine what has been revealed to Simeon? If God revealed that to you this morning, you will not die until you see the return of Jesus Christ. Every day would have so much expectation. I, I won't die till the second coming. And that's truly how God wants us to live. And that was how Simeon was living. He'd, he'd been promised he will not pass away until he got a look upon what God had promised for thousands of years. So Simeon has been told this, and he's carrying it in his heart and in his mind. And we, we don't even know how many days he's carried this revelation, but we know this. He was looking for the reality of it, the fulfillment of the promise of God, the anticipation he must have had of this coming moment of Messiah. And then in our text, one day, that day that we've been studying, in the fullness of time, the promise to Simeon was going to now meet with fulfillment, and that is the day in our text that we're looking at. Look with me in verse 27. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, he took him into his arms and he blessed God. The Spirit led Simeon into the temple, and at the exact same time, Mary and Joseph come in with the baby Jesus. And so there's nothing outward that would have been different, that would have brought any attention to Mary and Joseph in that temple. One of the great Jewish theologians, uh, Edersheim, said it would be normal for about 25 sets of parents to be in the temple at, at a time. So probably 25 parents as he comes in and he comes right up to this one baby that didn't have a halo around him. It was just a, a, a baby. And Simeon comes in and he takes that baby up into his arms. And what was cool to me in studying is the word that says he was looking for the consolation of Israel in verse 25 is the root word in verse 28, that he took him into his arms. So he's been waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the hope that Simeon was looking for is now the hope that he has embraced in his arms that he was receiving that day. And Simeon sees in the child what nobody else sees by the Holy Spirit of God, and he receives him. Let, let men prepare him room. Now he will declare what er, all need to know about this child. And so he's holding God's manikim, his comfort, his Messiah in his arms, what Israel had been waiting for for so long. Simeon had been waiting for so long, and now he holds what was promised since Genesis 3, that God would send in this, this seed who would crush the serpent's head and undo the works of the devil. So thousands of years, and now here he is. The history of this whole nation had been built upon this promise. And here's Simeon holding the Savior of the world. And he did what every one of us should do. He worshiped God. That's the only response to God's Messiah, is worship. He blessed God, it says. Oh, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God for the gift of the Manichaeum, the Messiah that he sent into the world. I got a little slide someone sent me. If, if, we, if we got it, we'll take a shot. Tell me if it comes up. I can't see anything. All I see is me. Oh. I just want you just to take a look. Simeon just taking up that baby, told by the Spirit of God, here he is. And now I want you to hear what he's going to say about that baby. Now, Lord, verse 29, 
You're releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. There's a definite article on that called The Salvation. My eyes have seen the salvation that has been promised for thousands of years. Here's the salvation. That's what God has been promising. This is what he's done. The object that I am now holding is God's. The Greek word is soterion. This is God's soteriology. This is God's salvation. I'm holding the salvation, the soterion, what God said he would send. I'm holding this baby in my arms. Simeon's looking at Jesus now by faith. He's not looking at a temple any longer. He's not looking at the sacrifices that are going on in that temple. He's not looking into the ark at the tablets of stone. He's not looking at his own strength, his own hands. He's gazing at a little baby saying, this is God's salvation. There is salvation nowhere else. There's no other name under heaven by which God has given for a man to be saved. There's, there's, this is the way. There's a God, this is God's salvation. This is God's gift to humanity. My pages are sticky today, sorry. This is his soterion. Here is the comfort. This is God's saving one. This is the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? This is an unbelievable moment in the history of the world. And all, the, all everyone in that room, uh, this room, even this day, I pray that we would all come to behold him the way Simeon did. I pray that there would be none who would miss out on God's soterion. I pray that no one would come short of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want you to see what happens when God opens your eyes to see this the way Simeon did by the Spirit. He says, now, Lord, let thy bondservant depart in peace. Let me leave this life now in peace. He's ready to die. And I would dare say that no one is ready to die until he looks at Jesus and says, I've seen God's salvation. Now I can depart in peace. I spent the last couple of weeks on deathbeds. And, and George Dago and uh, Hayden Porter's father, Dallas, went to glory on Friday. God saved him kind of in the tail end of his life. So he's with Jesus Christ right now. But... We pray for Hayden and his family. And as I watch these two men, I'm telling you, when you come to your deathbed, nothing else in this life, everything that you might be struggling with right now this morning, bills, relational struggles, health struggles, whatever you're sitting here with, I'm telling you, the only thing that's going to matter is that you've seen God's soterion. And I can now depart in peace. The sting of death has been taken away because of the one who was stung on the cross by his father. And this is what he's holding. He's saying, now I can die. I can leave. Because here is God's saving instrument of what he's promised. And I just, every little kid, every older kid, everyone in this room, I just pray that you've seen God's soterion. And you can depart in peace now. Because by faith, I've seen what God gave to be the Savior of sinners, among whom I am foremost. Verse 31. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you, God, have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, <coughs> Israel. You've prepared him in the presence of all. He's come into the world that he created. And as, a, the, as John, the apostle said, we, we, we beheld him, we saw him, we touched him. So God's salvation came in the world and we got to see him. We got to have fellowship with him. He, he's not far off. I want you to hear this. Jesus has come near and he's come gentle and meek in a manger. And he, he's just come to be a savior. And guys, he's, he's been presented then and prepared, he says, for all people. He, he's not just for a show. He's not just to be marveled at or discussed or have Bible studies about. He prepared him, as Simeon did, to be received. He, he's received the Manichim, received God's gift of salvation. He's been prepared to be received that you might have life. He is the means of grace. He is the only way to receive God's grace. Receive him. Don't stay at a distance and play religion. He's come to be received and be in for all peoples. 
Simeon declares this in the temple, the place of centralized religion. This soterion, he says, is for all the peoples. Amen? Preach the wideness of God's heart. This is it. His heart is wide. It's for the nations. It's for sinners. It's for Gentiles and Jews and and just blue collar, white collar, everything. I want you to see it's for all peoples. Behold, God's salvation. Simeon's going to expound on this a little bit more. He says he's a light of revelation to the Gentiles. He's a light to Gentiles. He will shine to the ends of the earth. God's saving purposes have always been every tribe, tongue, and nation since the creation. It's to go everywhere. He's to be a light that's to shine into the nations. Go, take it, tell it, spread it. Isaiah says it's going to reach to the ends of the earth. (laughs) He's a light of revelation. He's come to show us God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He came to show us his character and his plan of salvation. He's a light. He's come to tell us of God's beautiful salvation in his Son is salvation and eternal life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the light of the world. So he is a a light of revelation to the Gentiles. And he's the glory of your people, Israel. Israel's glory, Romans 9 speaks of it, whom is the Christ. The, The greatest glory of Israel is that from a Jewish womb came Messiah. What, a, what an amazing thing this nation had. The Messiah came from this genealogy. Salvation is from the Jews. And it's to, to be a light unto the world. And as, the, as, it, as it shines to the world, it, it gives even more glory to what came through Israel. <clears throat> the seed of Abraham is Israel's glory. It's the light of the Gentiles fulfills Israel's glory. And so have you seen what Simeon is seeing in the Christ. And I'm, just ask, I'm not asking you, can you hold him in your arms in a theological way? I'm telling you that theology is to teach us about this one. It's not to replace this one. So don't be satisfied with a theology about Christ. He's come to be received, to give salvation and to give life. This is salvation that gives what we've been seeing, peace. Peace with God, peace in your own heart, and peace with others. Do you see it? Simeon had a baby, and we got the whole life of Christ. We have his death and his burial and his ascension, his resurrection. He's a reigning king. We have so much more that we can look at and say, behold, God's soterion. After all of this, I want you to see Mary and Joseph's response in verse 33. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. They were amazed. They've seen angels. They saw a baby conceived by the Holy Spirit. They've heard what the shepherds say, and now it says they are amazed. Each revelation of Christ, we just keep seeing Mary and Joseph are amazed at what God is doing in these days. So are you amazed? Do these things hold joy and delight in your hearts? Do you treasure them up? Uh, What a beautiful thing that we have in Christ. So this morning, I want you to sit back now and and I want you just to look your eyes out at Jesus. I'm going to show you four ways. This is our application this morning of how to look at Jesus. So I want you just to look at Christ. First, take a lone look at Jesus. Take a steady look at the Messiah what I find is, is most this Christmas won't. Most of their lives are so busy, they're just surviving. They don't take downtime. They won't be still and know that he's God. Don't just sing hymns and cards and parties and gifts and wear sweatshirts that say Jesus is the reason for the season and not take a look at him. He was the focus of everything that Christmas morning. Simeon, everything else was lesser Zacharias, Elizabeth, Mary, angels, it's all Christ. The Magi and Anna, he's the focus. He's the focus of all revelation. It all points to me, he says. He's the focus of the apostolic preaching. He's the focus of heaven. He's the focus of the last day. All are going to see him. There's nothing more important than a steady look at Jesus Christ. Look at Christ. 
No sin or defect, no darkness, no stain, no fickleness in his love, his glory and his excellence. Look at Christ who's full of grace and truth. He's full of forgiveness and eternal life. This morning, I'm asking that you would be like Simeon and look blinded to all rival attractions. This is not window shopping. Christ is ours by faith. And I want you to take a lone look at Jesus this morning. But there, there's another kind of look that you must have, secondly, is I want you to take a spiritual look at Jesus. Many are going to look at Jesus this season, and He will do their souls no good at all. That is not sufficient just to look at Jesus. Three times in our text, it says the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit led Simeon, led Anna. Jesus, again, he had no halo. There were no angels above him, just a six-week-old baby, nothing different, nothing impressive to look at, just another baby with parents making a sacrifice. Yet Simeon comes and he takes this one and he blesses God. How? God had revealed to him who this one was. And so you can read the Gospels from now until he returns and not see who this one really is. You could be sitting here this morning and you've read this Bible from cover to cover and you've never seen who this Christ really is. I sang Christmas hymns for 20 years and I knew nothing of His glory. I understood nothing of the character and work of Jesus Christ. This morning, I'm going to ask you to take a spiritual look at Jesus. Go beyond the externals and the facts and all the songs. He was not just a good man and a great teacher. He's more than an example. He was a redeemer who went into death for me and he died to ransom me from the bondage of sin and death and the devil's hold over me. Religion is what you have to do to save yourself. But the gospel is what God has done to save you. And on that cross, he said, Tetelestai, it's finished. This Manichim, he, he did the work of God to bring about Soterion salvation. And so Simeon takes a spiritual look at this baby and he sees the glory of who he is. This is my salvation. Let me depart in peace. Unless you see what Simeon sees, uh, then, then you, don't, you don't see. This is not just happy thoughts about Christmas, but it's about the ark of salvation that God has prepared in the presence of all peoples. He alone was what Simeon looked at, my salvation. And so I ask you, have you seen this? He is all that your soul needs this morning, is just look at this Christ. Look your eyes out at this baby who was the Savior of the world and hear the Spirit say, even my sins have been forgiven. God, let me depart in peace. I can die in peace because he died in my place. So I want you to take a, a, a look at Jesus and I want you to take a spiritual look at Jesus. And then my third point is I'd like you to take a really serious look at Jesus. Simeon had a couple private words for Mary, and I want you to hear him in verse 34. And Simeon blessed then, and he said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child that I'm holding is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Shocking, huh? Wait a minute, Simeon, I, I like... Fulfillment, I like salvation and joy and hearken the herald. I like all these things. This is the first thing negative mentioned so far. Why does something always have to be negative, huh? The whole world's negative. I just want a positive message. I got up and came to this church and you're talking negative. Christians are just wet blankets at every party. There might be some truth to that. So as glorious as these things are about your baby Mary and Joseph, <laughs> he's also appointed... He's so Tyrion, yes, but he's also appointed for the fall and rise, hear this, of many. Many are going to fall and stumble over this stumbling stone. Though he is salvation, he is comfort, he is light, and he is glory, not everyone's going to embrace him. 
This should be the nation's greatest news and joy. This should have went everywhere. He should be embraced by everyone. God gave us salvation. Why is everybody not clamoring for it? What is this talk, Simeon? I want you to hear what Jesus said in Luke 12, interpreting it. He said, do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? Peace on earth, isn't that the message? I didn't come to bring peace on earth. I tell you, no, I, brought, I came to bring division. What? Division? From now on, five members in one household will be divided. Three against two and two against three. They will be divided. Father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, etc., etc. I'm going to bring division into families. Oh, Christ will be a dividing line between mankind, Simeon is prophesying. <clears throat> He's going to be the point of demarcation. Uh, hanging on a cross, two thieves on each side, one mocking him and one getting saved. That is the history of the world. He's either foolishness or the power of God unto salvation. And many are going to stumble over him. They're going to stumble over this rock. And John tells us that even his own didn't receive him in John 1. And not only that, he's going to be a sign to be opposed, which the Greek word means resisted. He's going to be resisted. They're going to stumble over him and they're going to hate him. How can that be? God's soterion. The creator giving up his own son, his own beloved son for salvation. How could you hate that? Because he will manifest what is true righteousness and what is true sonship. What does it look like to really be a follower of Christ. He's going to speak straight and truthful. He is the truth and he's going to reveal it. And men love their own God themselves and they're going to hate this message. And when mankind hears that you can bring nothing or do anything to save yourself, every cult is you can do something to save yourself. And you've got to depend on this gift alone for your salvation. It's very humbling. It's going to be resisted. And some of you are resisting it even this morning while you're smiling. Man will do anything for salvation except nothing. And so Jesus is a sign of God's salvation and mercy. And he's going to proclaim, I am God's saving one. I've come endowed with salvation. And they're going to want to throw rocks at him. And they're going to cry for his blood until they hang him up on a cross at the end of his life. He will be opposed but not if we make him a warm, moral, nice guy. If we make him accepting of everybody and non-judgmental, boy, everybody loves that kind of Jesus. It's like Santa Claus. Our whole society is doing it. What you might be doing in your own heart this morning, you've, you've just made a Jesus that fits you to live any way you want to live. But if you preach Jesus Christ truly, he says, unless you deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. You preach that, and you're going to divide mankind. And they're going to hate him, or they're going to love him. It'll just split it. Because he alone is God's soterion. And he says, you're bankrupt to commend yourself to God. You have nothing in you that can get God's acceptance. Apart from him, you can do nothing. Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Men will hate you and they will hate him for this message. And you've you got a choice. You can take the, take the truth out of the message, make it be whoever you want Jesus to be, and then someone's going to come and tell you the truth and you're going to hate them because they're going to tell you what Jesus has really said. But what about peace on earth? Peace that Simeon has is what he promised. And Simeon has peace because he's receiving his Savior, Christ the Lord. Jesus comes as the great divider. He's going to divide people. There's going to be conflict between people. And he's going to divide hearts. There's going to be conflict within people. So I want you to see the balance to last week about forbearance and all of these things with, with family, is that Jesus says, I'm going to stick a sword right in the middle of families. And, and don't let it be anything but Jesus that divides up a family. If there's anything but that, stop. But if you stick Jesus, and, and all of a sudden a family's divided, then praise God. 
Praise God, because he said that's what's going to happen. And so I want you to just see that he said, the Son of God is going to divide. And it's not the, the popular message at Christmas. But there's some of your families that you're going to gather and have ham and talk nice things. And, and what unites you is not Jesus. And if you brought the real Jesus into the family, it would just split it into pieces. And so I'm just telling you right now, this is God's salvation. And yes, he's a savior. But if you won't receive him, you're going to divide up and there's going to be enmity and there's going to be rejection and there's going to be a hatred if you preach the true Christ and live a salty life like Christ. So we're not trying to just appease everybody. This Christ is going to be a divider of mankind. He always has been and, and he will be till he returns. So there will be conflict between people in verse 34. He will cause you to rise or fall. There's no in-between. He will be divisive. And the reason is because of the repulsiveness of his claims that you need to die. And he needs to be your Lord and you need to follow this Christ. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And the other is the attractiveness of his life will make you be willing to give up everything that you have to follow this Christ and have him. So he will be a divider. And so the repulsiveness of the claims of Christ is Jesus is going to make you rise or fall. You're either going to see his beauty as Simeon did and embrace him uh, and all of the, his claims on your life. I receive him. Or you're going to hate him. And you're going to create your own Jesus of your own imagination. I can, I can live with my, my girlfriend and still everything's fine. Jesus is a forgiver. And you're just going to make all your little rules and, and make some Jesus that just fits you. That's what you'll do. And that's hating him. Instead of looking at his word, who's the real Jesus? And receiving the true Jesus and quit making up a different one. Receive him. Don't create Jesus in your mind. I'll tell you this, he's, I've never seen it bring peace to one person. Every time I meet someone who's made their own Jesus, they never have peace. And they're always trying to convince everybody that they're okay, why they're right, and they never can rest. But man, those who have taken the mannequin are those who are at rest. And they're just at peace and they're being transformed and changed. What God brought that morning is to be received. And he, he, he did it in the presence of all peoples. He offers it to all. So I want to ask you this. What is coming out of your heart as I'm preaching this? It's going to tell you a lot. I'm not doing this to aggravate you. I'm doing this to save you. <laughs> What's coming out of your heart as you're hearing this? The true revelation of Christ and his words demand a response. This mannequin has to have a response, and there's only two. To receive him or to reject him. And, and rejecting him can be cloaked in morality, nice thoughts, enjoying stories about Jesus, singing songs that remind us of our childhood and lighting candles. You can reject him with all of that. So the question that must be answered this morning what have you done with the Lord's salvation? Take a serious look this morning. I don't care if you've grown up in a Christian home your whole life. Take a serious look at Jesus and have you received him. And my last point, I didn't come to be a Scrooge. I want you to have a Merry Christmas so bad. I want you to take a saving look at Jesus. I want you to do what Simeon did. Take him in your arms and receive the Christ. Embrace Christ as your Savior. A faith that receives the Redeemer. He's not just recognized, but he's embraced with your whole soul. He is the divinely sent Savior for sin. By a saving look at Jesus, you can depart in peace. Isn't that the best news you could ever hear? Sitting on deathbeds, I treasure this more than I ever have. I can depart in peace because he didn't get to. <laughs> he departed draining the enmity of God against my sin. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. 
Simeon held him in his arms as he leaned on the everlasting arms. Fall into the redeeming arms of Jesus this day. Look to the cross. Look to his perfect life that's all offered. God's way of bringing salvation. And just none of you, just look at Christ. Look away from you and religion. Just look at this beautiful Savior, resurrected in victory, who has now made the grave sweet and aroma for the believer. You can depart in peace because of this Savior. Will you just look this morning at this Christ? And then you will have a merry, merry Christmas. And you'll have a merry, merry eternal life forever with Him. All glory be to Christ alone. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the glory and the beauty of what you, by your Spirit, inspired and gave us through all these thousands of years. You have given us a perfect record of your word. God, and we can rest and receive what you promised. The Messiah, the Manichim, the consolation of Israel. Oh God, I thank you that you prepared him in the presence of all peoples. And that there's no one here outside of that all peoples. I pray that anyone in here who has never received this Christ, oh God, that even this morning now they would quit fighting from within. The white flag is held out in Christ to have peace with God. I pray that they would receive this child by faith. This child who uh, went and grew up and died on a cross and is resurrected in victory. God, give them eyes to see. Let them receive this beautiful Christ. And I pray for Southside Bible Church. God, I pray that this this thing that Simeon held in his arms, that every one of us hold the Lord Jesus Christ. And every one of us can depart in peace because we've seen the Lord's salvation. God, I pray that our people would die well and that we would fill up with Christ during our days. And that we would have all of Christ for the rest of eternity. God, I pray, lift burdens and weights and sicknesses and hearts that are overwhelmed with all the stuff going on around us and the hurt and the pain that's coming out. I pray for Hayden Porter and his sweet family. God, I pray that you comfort them. I pray that the comfort would be in the comforter. I pray that we would all just look at this Christ. And one day we're going to be gathered together forever and you're going to wipe away every tear. Oh God, what is come, coming for the people of God, I pray, let it lift our hearts this morning. And that is the safest day because Christ came into the world first to save us before he comes to gather it in and bring in the new creation. God, thank you for the beautiful Christ. Let every heart be blessed and encouraged by looking this morning. And it's in his precious name that we do pray. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. And we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.